You know, as we begin to emerge from our seclusion, I want to share something with you this morning as we begin to emerge out of our seclusion, and that is that, believe it or not, your quarantine, it could have been a whole lot worse than it was. What if, what if you had had to spend a whole year with your in-laws in a confined place and you could not leave and go somewhere else? Now, you, today you might be with your in-laws, but at least you can get in the car and go somewhere else. But Noah's daughters-in-law were with Noah and his wife for over a year and they couldn't go anywhere. Your quarantine, it could have been worse than it was. I want you to imagine being in that ark with all of those animals for over a year. All of the stinky animals for over a year. Imagine being in an ark where Noah decided to be a good idea to take some skunks and to save the skunks. And you get to be on an ark for over a year with all of those stinky animals. I want you to imagine being on that ark with all of the noisy animals. I don't know what you think of when you think of a noisy animal. You know, a goose is a loud, annoying animal. Can you imagine being on an ark for over a year with loud, annoying, noisy animals? Can you imagine being on an ark for over a year with the creepy animals? I don't know what creeps you out. You like snakes? Some of you like snakes. A lot of you don't like snakes. Can you imagine being on an ark when you went to sleep every night and you wondered, did Shem lock up the snake cage and that's on your mind as you're getting ready to go to sleep that night i'm telling you today your quarantine you, you if you thought it was bad your quarantine could have been a whole lot worse and here we are today slowly starting to emerge from our seclusion what i want us to do today is to open our bibles to genesis chapter 8 and chapter 9 and i want us to see what happened when noah and his family began to emerge from their seclusion where they had been for over a year inside of this ark and finally in Genesis chapter 8 and chapter 9 they begin to be allowed to come out of that ark and I want you to go and step inside of their shoes and be there with them what what is the first thing that you would have liked to have done if you were able to come out of the ark after a year what would you have liked to have done? I mean, would you, would you have looked for a drive through Would you have been looking to see if Starbucks was open yet? What would you, after a year where you couldn't have anything on the outside world, what would you have been wanting the most to do right then? I want us to look this morning at two instinctive responses. What does that mean? Two things that Noah just did. Noah just instinctively did when he came out of this ark because these were two things that were just ingrained in his soul that he wanted to do. Two things. What did he do? The first instinctive response of Noah when he stepped out of that ark is that he worshiped God. The very first thing he did when he got out the Bible tells us, is that he worshiped God. Look in Genesis chapter 8 and look in verse 20. And I want you to see that when we begin looking at worship, and we're going to see about five things about worship here in, in verse 20 and the first part of verse 21. But as we begin to think about worship and what worship is, we need to see that when it comes to what we learn about Noah's worship, at least in this case, is that true worship involves effort. True worship is effortful. It involves effort. How do we know that? What does is, what is the very first part of verse 20 say? Noah built an altar to the Lord. We just read right over that and we keep going. What did that involve? Noah came out of the ark ready to worship God. And before he could fully worship God, he had to gather together enough stones to build an altar. 
I mean, he didn't go down to Home Depot and say, hey, you got one of those altar building kits in stock? I need one of those. He didn't, it, no, he comes out of the ark in a place that would be unfamiliar to him. And if it was familiar before, the waters of the flood had completely made that area unfamiliar to him. Now he comes out and he's got to find stones large enough to build an altar, to leave a place in there where he could put a fire inside of it. Worship is effortful. Worship requires effort on our part. Is that a bad thing? No, that ought to be a good thing. That we, we ought to look at that as a good thing, where worship on my part requires some work, requires some effort. You know, and, and when, sometimes when we're worshiping online and we're worshiping from home, sometimes we, we might not think about the effort that would be involved. Sometimes we might roll out of bed at the last minute and pop it on and sit there and just watch it. But we ought to think about worship as something that we engage in that takes effort on our part. You know a number of times throughout the Psalms where the Bible talks about, and, and in Psalm 111 is, is one of those places where it says that, that I will praise you with my whole heart. Everything I've got, everything I've got I want to put into my worship. You know, there are, there are some things that we need to do as we think about worship. There are some things that we need to make sure we are doing, that we are giving ourselves to do in our effort to worship God and to worship Him acceptably. And sometimes it, it takes some time to get ready. There's one of our members that when we, when we meet regularly on Sunday mornings, there's one of our members who has to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning just to have enough time to get ready. You think, wow, it doesn't, there, there are things that people have to do in life that you would never imagine. Can you imagine you having to get up at four o'clock in the morning to come to worship? It takes you that long to be able to get ready to leave the house. That's a lot of effort. But this person does it every week because they want to worship God. Somebody says, oh, well, you know, it takes too long to get the kids ready. Worship requires some effort. But it ought to be something that we want to do. But it's not only effortful. The Bible teaches us in this text that worship ought to be something that is intentional. Look in verse 20. He built an altar. All that's involved in that. I wish we could just talk about all that would be involved in building an altar. And then it says in the second place, He took of every clean animal and every clean bird. He took of every clean animal and every clean bird. What is that? What, what, what's that involved? Go back to chapter 7. Go back to chapter 7 and verse 2. Well, verse 1 is where the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. And verse 2 is where God told Noah, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal. And so it's in chapter 8 and verse 20 where we're told Noah brought to worship, he brought to sacrifice of the clean animals. Do you know when Noah started getting ready to worship God in Genesis 8 and verse 20? Do you know when he started to get ready? He was going to worship God when he came out of the ark. You know when he started to get ready for that worship? Over a year before. When he brought those clean animals into the ark. He was getting ready to go to worship God a year later. He was intentional about his worship. He was determined. He was getting ready to worship God a year before it ever took place. What about us? Are, are, are we intentional about getting ready to worship God? Do, do, do we long for the time when we can worship God? The psalmist in, in, in Psalm 42 in verse 2, you know Psalm 42 in verse 1 because we sing a song that says, As the deer pants for the water. That's from Psalm 42 and verse 1. But Psalm 42 and verse 2 says, For um, my soul thirsts for the living God. And then listen to this question. My soul thirsts for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When can I go to worship is what he's saying. When can I come and appear before God and worship him? We ought to be anticipating. We ought to be planning for. We ought to be looking forward to worshiping God. It ought to be the highlight of our week. We ought to be getting ready for it during the week. On Saturday, on Saturday night, our events, our activities on Saturday night should not take away from our readiness to be worshiping God on the next day. That, that Noah would have never thought about his Saturday night activities taking... He was getting ready a year before, not just the night before, to worship God. 
His worship was intentional. Last part of verse 20, his worship was sacrificial. The Bible says that he brought of the clean animals and he offered them as a burnt offering. That burnt offering is going to consume that, the entirety of that sacrifice. Noah brought the best that he, he didn't bring the unclean animals. He brought the best that he had and he offered that to God. That's a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice saying, oh, well, you know, this, this animal's been sick for the last two months. We've been nursing him along just to get to this point. All right, bring out that sick animal and lay him. That's, that's not a sacrifice. That, you're, that's, you're, you're getting rid of something you don't need. His worship was sacrificial. Is our worship, is our worship sacrificial? The Bible talks about the fact that when we worship, and it's not, this is not just financial, don't think financial. That our worship, when we worship God, is, is giving of ourselves. Read Psalm 96 uh, and, and, and see how many times in, seven, eight, in verses 7, 8, and 9, it says, Give unto the Lord, all you peoples. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into the courts. There's a sacrifice that we ought to be willing to make when we come together. A willing sacrifice when we come together to worship. Because as we see with Noah, worship is something that we're trying to make acceptable to God. It's, it's not that we're trying to make it acceptable. Let's look at verse 21. What does verse 21 say? That the worship, the sacrifice went up to God as a soothing aroma. It didn't just go up to God as an aroma. <laughs> There's a burning animal on the altar. What kind of aroma would you call that? Soothing? Hmm, I don't think so. But because it was a worshipful act unto God, it went up to God as a soothing aroma. Noah wanted his worship to please God. And I should want nothing more than when I have prepared myself intentionally to come together to worship, when I have come together to worship and, and offered and given my time and effort in order to do that and, and not worried about looking at the clock to see how long the worship is going, and when I've come and made a sacrifice unto God, I do that because, God, I want this to be acceptable to you. The reason you are here today, the reason that there are 43 people in this auditorium right now instead of seven like we've had for the last few weeks, is because the elders said it's time for us to start coming back together and worshiping, and you were ready for it. And that's, that is not to say to those who are watching online, that is not to say to those who are, who are at home and watching online and have decided to follow what the elders also said, and that, and that is that if you feel you are at risk or feel that you pose a risk, then it's okay for you to stay home for, for a few more weeks. That's not to say that you haven't made the effort and that you are not sacrificed. That's what, but that's what worship is wherever we are is that we're not trying to make this acceptable to us. We're trying to make this acceptable to God because the last thing we learned about worship from Noah here is that worship ought to be joyful. This was the first thing. First thing we're told that he did when he came out of the ark. You know, when, whatever it was that you did first, whatever it was that you wanted to do first when you were emerging out of your seclusion, whether, you know, when, when, when we entered into phase one last week, which meant restaurants could now seat you at 25% capacity, did that, did that say, hello, okay, that, uh, do you know where you want to go now? You know, when, it, are there certain things that bring you joy and that's what you longed for? And I'm not saying any of that, none of that's wrong. Things that brought you joy and that's the first thing you wanted to do when it was opened back up. First thing Noah wanted to do when that, door opened on the ark was to come out and worship God. And you're here today because that's what you wanted. You wanted with a heart full of joy to be able to come together with brethren and to worship. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. When the elders on Wednesday night stood in front here and they announced what was going to happen today. And what you remember the last three words they said? It was on the screen too. Last three words they said, see you Sunday. You remember the smiles that were on their faces when they said it? They were glad when they were able to say, let's come to the house of the Lord. Let's worship God.
Noah's instinctive response to emerging, emerging out of seclusion was, I want to worship God. Second instinctive response is Noah trusted God. I want you to imagine being Noah. And God came to you, and God came to you and told you to build an ark. I want you to imagine being Noah, and God came to you and told you to build an ark. And you started building that ark with, in, with faith in God. That's, that's all, and that's what Hebrews 11 and verse 7 says. By faith, Noah built this ark, prepared the ark for the saving of his household. Had he ever seen an ark? Had he ever been ark, sharp, ark shopping before? Had, had, had he ever you know, seen how to do that? Did he have a YouTube video that said, Here, how, here's how you build an ark. Just watch these videos. He spends 100 years building this ark. And then he's inside for over a year and comes out. You think this man trusts God now? There's nobody on earth except for Noah, Mrs. Noah, and three sons and their wives. You think he trusts God now? He comes out of that ark. And what we see in Genesis chapter 8 is before God ever says anything, look, look at how this is worded in verse 21. The Lord said in his heart. The Lord is thinking this to himself, if you want to think of it that way. The Lord is saying this to himself. He's thinking this to himself. He is conceiving of a covenant that he's going to make with Noah, but he hasn't verbalized it yet. He's, he's thinking of the promise that he's getting ready to make to Noah, but he hasn't said it to him yet. Has God made us any promises? Think of all the promises that God has made to us. And when did God conceive of those promises? When you think about the promises that God has made to us in the Bible, when did he conceive of these promises? He conceived of these promises before he ever made the world. We're going to talk about a couple of those promises in just a moment. But when you think about the promises of God, when you think about the promise of salvation, the promise of heaven that God has made to us, he made those promises before he ever, he, he conceived of those promises before he ever made the world. Here's God conceiving of a promise, of a covenant he's going to make with Noah and with all people. And he's, he's conceiving it before he's ever saying it. And all the promises God's made to us, they weren't second, they, they, they weren't last minute kind of things. He already had them in mind as to what he was going to say. So he, God conceives of this covenant in chapter 8, but you get over to chapter 9. And in over chapter 9 is where God conveyed this covenant to Noah. And we don't have time to look at all of this, but would you look in verse 9? Look in chapter 9. God starts talking to Noah in verse 8. And if you look in chapter 9 and verse 9, do you see the word covenant in verse 9? Look down in verse 11. Do you see the word covenant in verse 11? Look down in verse 12. Can you find the word covenant in verse 12? Look down in verse 13. Can you find the word covenant in verse 13? Look down in verse 15. Can you find the word covenant? Look down in verse 16. Can you find the word covenant? Look down in verse 17. Can you find the word covenant? Do you get the idea? Seven times. Seven times from verse 9 down to verse 17, God's talking about his covenant, 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 covenant. Seven times. What's this? God's saying, I'm making a promise to you. I'm making a promise to you. What's this promise? I want you to see what this promise... Look back, hold your, hold your eyes there for just a second, but come back to verse 21. When God is conceiving of the promise, what is the promise in verse, of chapter 8 and verse 21? The, he's conceiving of the promise, I will never again do something. Sometimes you promise that you are going to do something. Here is God making a promise that I am never again going to do something. The end of the verse says, nor will I again destroy every living creature. Now look in chapter 9. Look in verse 11. Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Look down at verse 15. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of, the, uh, of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Four times. God's making a covenant seven times, he uses that word, and four times he says, never again, never again, never again, never again. Can you trust God? Here's these promises. Here are these great... Did, did your parents ever tell you never to use the word never? Did your parents ever say, don't say always and don't say never? Why? Because it's rare that you can ever say, well, it's always this way, because it's not usually always. And it's, you, it's rare that you can say, well, that never happens, because 
You know, what you you're always you always treat her better than you treat me. Is that true? Maybe with your parents it was. Maybe you didn't deserve to be treated as well as 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 your sister, your brother. But when you use the word always or you use the word never, those superlatives, parents often say to their children, don't use those words. Because it's rarely the case, is it always or never? Here's God four times saying, never, 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 never again am I going to do this. Has God made any promises to us like that that are, that are what, what I would think of as not promises of what he's going to do, but promises of what he's not going to do? Can you think of any never promises from God? Can you think of any not promises from God, things that he's promised he's not going to do? Probably the one that we think of the most is the promise of his abiding presence. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, what does he say? I will never, same word he said to Noah, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can you believe that promise just as much as, as Noah believed the promise that God would never again flood the earth? Same God, same words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have the promise of God's abiding presence in our lives. We've got the promise of God of His continual forgiveness. We see His continual forgiveness in 1 John 1 and verse 7. But that's more in a positive way where it says He will forgive us of our sins. But it's in Hebrews 8 and verse 12 where God talks about our sins and our lawless deeds. And He says, I will remember them. Did you hear that? God says, here's your sins, here's your lawless deeds, and I will remember them. You know what he says after that? No more. Never again, no more am I going to remember your sins. Can we believe that? Can we believe God saying, I'm never again going to remember those sins? As much as Noah could believe, never again am I going to flood the earth. God says, no more. No more am I going to remember. Are, are you thankful for that promise? Are you thankful for the promise of God that, that when God says, here's your sins, and I'm going to put them over here, and I'm not going to remember them anymore? Are you glad that he doesn't remember those anymore? You remember them. Your friends remember them. Your enemies remember them. Aren't you glad God doesn't remember them anymore? We've got the promise in the Bible of God's continual, inseparable love. I, can, can, can you flip over to Romans 8 for just a minute? We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to wrap up this lesson real quick here in just a second. But I want you to see, you remember how many times we saw the word never in, in, in Genesis chapter 8 and 9? Never, 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 never. Four times God said, never again, never again am I going, and can, can you believe that promise? He's never flooded the earth again. I want you to see Romans chapter 8. I want you to see God talking about superlative nature of his inseparable love. I want you to count with me the number of times you see the word neither or the word nor. The last two verses of Romans chapter 8. How many times do you see the word neither or the word nor? And here's, here's a promise of God that, 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 is, that is put in, in, in sort of this negative context. For I am persuaded, verse 38, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things, to pre nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How many did you get? You want to do it again? Did you miss one? How many did you get? Ten times. Ten times God says, nope, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. None of those things are going to be able to separate you from my love. Can you, can you trust that promise? As much as God said, I'm not going to do that again, never again, God says, none of these things will be able to separate you from my love. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that when he, taught, when, that when he has promised us his unconditional love, that those who are in Christ Jesus, he says, when you remain in Christ, you will never be separated from my love. The final promise that I want us to think about when we think about these never or these not promises that God has made of things that he will not do or things that he will not allow to happen is that the Bible teaches us that God, when, when he looks down at us, he looks at us in our, in our condition of, of yielding to sin maybe too often, that we've got the promise of God of his assistance to help us escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 
God's promise to help us escape from sin. When God tells us, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 says, No temptation is overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Here's three of my favorite words in the Bible. But God is faithful. Now here's the never part of it. Who will not, not, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear. But will with that temptation also make the way of escape. On the positive side, God will make the way of escape. But on the negative side, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. God knows what your threshold is on temptation. And he will never allow you to be tempted above or beyond what you're able to bear. Can you believe that promise? Somebody says, I don't know if that's true. Has God ever flooded the earth again? Never, 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 never. He said, it's never going to happen. Will he allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear? Never will he let it happen. God has conveyed to us, just as he did to Noah, some incredible promises. And just as, he, just as much as he conceived it, and then he conveyed it, conveyed it the last part I want you to see back in Genesis chapter 9 is that he confirmed it. What did, how did he confirm it? You know how he confirmed it. He confirmed it by putting that rainbow in the sky. And by putting that rainbow in the sky, God said, you look at that rainbow, and every time you see that rainbow, underline and see how many times you see the word sign. We won't go and look at it in Genesis chapter 9, but see how many times you see the word sign. Sign, sign, sign. All, all down the last part of that chapter. What is he saying? I'm going to confirm to you. I just made a promise to you. Now, here's, here, here's how I'm going to authenticate that promise. Every time you see a rainbow, it is a reminder from me to you that I will keep my promises. Is God going to keep his promises to us? You know he will. The Bible not only says that it's impossible for him to lie, it says that he cannot lie. It, it, is, it is just a violation of his very nature, Titus 1 and verse 2 says. But not only does this book claim that he cannot lie, it proves it to us. Sometime go and read the last verse of Joshua 21. Last verse of Joshua 21. They have come into the promised land. Where did the promised land come from? Listen to the word. Where did the promised land come from? How did they get to the promised land? Who came up with the idea of the promised land? Oh, that was a land that was promised to them by God. And the last verse of Joshua chapter 21 says, Not a word failed of all that God had promised them. It all came to pass. And there may have been some doubters in that day and say, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. Here's the deal. God made a promise and he kept it to them. When you get to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul refers back to a promise that was made to Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Paul says, he didn't say to seeds, he said to seed, and that's Christ. God promised to send Christ more than a thousand years before he ever came, and he fulfilled that promise. And every promise he makes to us, he fulfills two instinctive responses when Noah comes out of that ark. Worship God, trust God. And as we start to emerge out of our seclusion and come back to our normal lives, whatever your normal life might look like, may God help us to not lose sight of these two things that ought to just be instinctive for us, to worship him and to trust every promise that he makes to us. We are not today going to sing an invitation song as we often would in our services. But by the nature of our services today, we, we will not be having that invitation song that we would encourage somebody to respond to the gospel. But the reality is that that invitation is always open. And in order to, we've been talking about emerging out of seclusion, in order to emerge out of the isolation that sin brings us in, there are some things that we need to do in order to do that. We share those with you today as we share them each and every time we're gathered together. That in, order to be coming, that in order to come out of sin as we need to, we need to believe that Jesus is God's Son, to repent of our sins, to confess our faith in Christ, to be baptized for the remission of all of our sins. That's not something that the Church of Christ came up with. That's something that's right here 
in the same book that tells us about Noah and the flood and the promises that God made is the book that tells us how to be saved. And are you aware that the Bible likens Noah and his family being saved to us being saved? Noah obeyed God, and if we will obey God, we can be just as saved as Noah was from that flood. We're going to sing one more song, one, one more verse of a song, and then we'll have a closing prayer. And unfortunately, we do need to ask something of you after the closing prayer, and that is we're going to have to leave. Uh, unfortunately, we can't stand around and talk like we always would. Uh, and I, it just it, it hurts inside just to even ask you to do that. Um, but unfortunately, we're going to have to ask that you, that you go ahead and leave after the closing prayer. But it has been so good. It has been so good to see all of you. Let's sing about being a part of God's family. And then we'll have a closing prayer.